Welcome back to this course on human sexuality. This is lecture two or talk two, which is about Jesus's sexual ethics and creation design. And once again, I just want to acknowledge God's presence. Jesus, as we share the, these materials, I pray that you would just again speak to everyone who listens and open their hearts and minds to see the truth of how you have made reality, how you have put things together, and what is good for human society. Oh Lord, teach us and just minister to us by your Spirit and by your Word of Truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, in this second lecture, I will be looking at, again, sexual ethics. The previous lecture, I did step one, which was just a very brief analysis of the current situation of human sexuality in terms of its brokenness and all the various characteristics of brokenness. And then we do step two, as what ought it to be human sexuality? What was God's original intention and design in human sexuality? That's the ideal, and we move from the real towards the ideal. So we'll be discussing God's vision of human sexuality, healthy human sexuality. And the third step is how do we be free to experience that which involves redemption and discipleship, which we will come to. So in this first um, segment, I will introduce Jesus' sexual ethics and then go back to what is called the Holiness Code, and the seventh commandment and explain that and then have a forward view to what human sexuality will look like um, in the age to come in the resurrection of our bodies but that's actually a very interesting uh, point that uh, gives us perspective on what is human sexuality from god's point of view so first of all then what ought human sexuality to be as god intended it when he first created human beings? That's the question. So a biblical vision of human sexuality, again, involves Jesus and his view, which then goes back into the Hebrew Bible. And in summary, we can put it like this. The Hebrew, Jesus was a Jew, of course, so I talk about the Hebrew vision of human sexuality as interpreted by Jesus and understood by Jesus. It has to do essentially with creation, a new creation because creation has been broken through human rebellion against God in Adam and Eve and all the ensuing brokenness um, and the 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 result is there is a need for human beings to be newly created in God's image to be saved redeemed changed transformed so we talk about creation and new creation and it falls into four essential steps the creation design and purpose in genesis 1 and 2 then the fall of humanity and broken creation genesis 3 and onwards <laughs> then redemption and salvation in and through the messiah jesus and what that means sexual salvation and sexual healing and sexual transformation and then lastly the fourth step is new creation glorification the glorification of our bodies and what that means in terms of human sexuality so then let's start with jesus and um, the way he understood it so i'm going to read a text for you from the book of mark chapter 10 just that you're aware whenever i get to certain key texts i have it out here in my powerpoint and i'll read it to you but you're welcome obviously to get your bibles look up the text and read it with me to check that I'm following actually what it says and I'm going to have a sip of hot tea. But in Mark chapter 10, 
Jesus is asked by the Pharisees about the question of divorce, because in his day, divorce was very common. And you could divorce your wife for any and every reason. Let me read it and see how Jesus then interprets human sexuality and answers their question. The Pharisees asked Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And in those days, men divorced their wives, not the other way around. Women couldn't divorce a man. What did Moses command you? Jesus replied. And they said, oh, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus said, it's because of the hardness of your hearts that Moses allowed this to happen. But it was not like that in the beginning. So Jesus immediately goes back to the beginning of creation. And he says, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And here he's quoting literally Genesis 1 verse 26. And then he quotes Genesis 2 verse 24. For this reason, because God made human beings male and female, for this reason, the male will leave his father and his mother and will be united to his wife, the female, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no person separate. That's what Jesus answered. And I draw out of it a few points um, um, to, to take note of. Here, Jesus bases his sexual ethics on creation design for acceptable, normal human behavior in terms of sexuality, which expresses the image, of, the image of God in creation because God created human beings in a differentiated image of male and female in relationship to express His image on earth. And so God's creation design in sexual differentiation and healthy sexual engagement is God's moral purpose for the good of humanity and for the good of creation. Secondly, Jesus emphasizes the two-ness of the sexual bond from Genesis 1 and, and Genesis 2. And, he, and thirdly, he limits sexual partners to male and female in a marriage union. In other words, the two-ness is the male and the female that become one in a covenant of marriage, in this marriage union. And therefore, a third party cannot complete and make the two whole. Only the two coming together as male and female make the one, the complete whole, and not a third party. So Jesus limits it basically to two parties, therefore prohibiting polygamy. And Polygamy was common at the time of Jesus and in the Old Testament and in some more um, in other cultures even today still. But in terms of the Christian revelation in and through Ad Adam and Eve, um, it's a monogamous relationship between a man and a woman as God's ideal creation design. So polygamy is prohibited. Polyamory, multiple partners, and polygyny, um, and it's same-sex partners in uh, in Greco-Roman world that was known and was practiced. All these forms were known and practiced. So Jesus, in the context of his time in the Greco-Roman world, prohibits that and speaks of monogamy. And thereby he, pro he prohibits the revolving door of marriage and divorce, where for any and every cause, the man has the power just to write out a, a so-called pink slip or a Certificate of divorce, give it his wife and she has to move out and then he can marry someone else. And Jesus stops all that and says, no, that is not God's creation design. In Matthew, the same passage as in Mark, but Matthew adds in one important detail. Jesus in Matthew says there's one reason that is um, allowed in a sense as a legitimate reason for divorce. And that is... Uh, pornias, the Greek word uh, to sexual immorality, sexual engagement outside of the covenant of marriage. So I'll just read the text from Matthew chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. The same question is asked by the Pharisees. Can we divorce 
for any and every reason. And the same answer is given. Go back to Moses. But he allowed it because of the hardness of your hearts. And then it adds here, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way in the beginning. And I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality. That's the NIV. By the way, when I read the um, scripture, I'm reading mostly from the New International Version, which is today accepted academically in theological biblical scholars as the standard text to work from. Except for sexual immorality. The Greek word there is pornia or pornias, from which in English we get the word pornography. And if a person engages in um, sexual immorality with another person outside of marriage, then that funda um, fundamentally breaks the covenant of the marriage bond because it's sexual engagement with another partner outside of marriage. And that was one reason that Jesus gave as a legitimate reason for divorce as opposed to all the other reasons. Then Jesus interprets what he means by ponias, or sexual immorality. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 30, he says, You've heard that it was said, you mustn't commit ponias. He's referring to the seventh commandment now. Don't engage in sex outside of marriage, because it breaks the marriage bond as per creation design. In Genesis 1 and 2, he said, But I tell you, Anyone who looks after a woman, and in those days, of course, it was male-dominated, but anyone who looks after, after a man or a woman in a lustful way has already committed pornias in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to stumble, then gouge it out and throw it away. It's better to lose one part of your body uh, than lose your whole body and be thrown into hell. Very strong, powerful language by Jesus. But what he means is this. Long before you get to the point of outwardly acting in your body, sexual immorality, in other words, erotic genital engagement outside of the covenant of marriage, long before you reach that point of behavior, you've already started it and cultivated it in your heart by actually nurturing lust through broken human sexuality, instead of using your sexuality as God's creation design to love people in a pure, holistic way. So when I look at a woman in a way whereby I dwell on her beauty that begins to make me sexually aware, and even begins to arouse sexual feelings in my, not only in my mind, but through my mind and images in my body, that's what is called lust, where I begin to objectify the other person and undress them or think of them or treat them in fantasy in a way whereby I'm satisfying my own desires and my sinful, basically corrupted desires. <laughs> so that lust in the heart actually is idolatry. So there's a phrase that a guy has written a very important book. I can't remember his name at the moment. It's called The Affair of the Mind. The lust of the mind, the fantasy of the mind, is the idolatry of the heart. When I cultivate fantasy in the mind of people and pictures and images, especially that are genitalized, it ends up being an, a form of idol worship in my heart for self-pleasure and self-power and self-fulfillment. It's all again about me, myself and I, as opposed to the gift of human sexuality as a relational service to love other people in a holistic way and thereby I am fulfilled and completed in who God made me to be. So it turns it on its head from love to lust which is a slow process of cultivation. And believe you me, we are all willing to do good, but we are ready to do wrong. And if you're conditioned inwardly through the cultivation of fantasy and lust in your heart, 
It's just a matter of time before the devil presents the right circumstance or the right person as a setup. And you will find it hard to say no, to act out your fantasy that you've cultivated as lust in your heart. So Jesus says you've got to go right back to the root cause and exercise the discipline of chastity there to save you so that you live purely and well with your human sexuality. So then going on, Jesus uses another word besides pornea, which is the, pornea is the summary word from the seventh commandment that covers all the different sexual sins of the holiness code in Leviticus 18 and 19. But in Mark chapter 7, as well as Matthew 15, the parallel passage, there's another word that goes back to the holiness code. So there was a question about uh, eating food with unwashed hands and the Pharisees accused Jesus' disciples of being impure, ceremonially unclean by eating food without washing their hands. And Jesus says it's not what enters a person that makes you unclean or defiles you, but actually it's what comes out the person. And then he says, because it is from inside you, the cultivation of the heart, where all sorts of sinful stuff starts happening in here before it comes out here. It's from within you, out of the person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And he first lists sexual immorality. The Greek word is poneus. Then theft, murder, greed, malice. Then lewdness. In our English Bible, it is lewdness or licentiousness. The Greek word there, asylgia, is a particularly powerful Greek word that referred to a stench. And that word is also goes back to the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So Leviticus 18 and chapter 20, the Holiness Code, when it was translated into the Greek language in 150 BC, before Christ. So Jesus had available to him the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and the Greek translation of the Old Testament that is called the Septuagint because 70 Jewish elders translated it. That word asylgi is also used back there, which speaks of very perverse sex in terms of acting out our own brokenness. And Jesus says that is what defiles a person. In other words, all that I'm saying is this. Jesus knew the Hebrew Scriptures. He, he worked with Genesis. He worked with Deuteronomy chapter 7, the Ten Commandments. He worked with the Holiness Code. And he quoted it, albeit translated in the New Testament in Greek. So then in closing, the future vision of human sexuality. In Luke chapter 20, verse 34 to 36, uh, Jesus was asked by the Pharisees about a woman whose husband died and then the, bro the brother had to then, then marry the widow according to the Leverite law to, to raise children. But he died and of the five brothers who married the woman, <laughs> the question was, in the resurrection, in the age to come, whose wife will she be? But she's had five husbands now in this world. And Jesus said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, because in the resurrection we'll be as the angels of God. We will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In other words, what Jesus is saying that in our resurrection bodies, genital sexuality will be transcended and fulfilled in its ultimate purpose of creation, which is the power to love people purely as God loves. In the age to come, we will love as God loves, purely and holy without any taint of genital sexual awareness as in the need to copulate and procreate. And so the gift of human sexuality is a this age phenomena to teach us to love well as God loves, which will be perfected and completed in our glorified bodies in the age to come. That is the end of our first segment of Lecture 2. Thank you. Welcome back. This is Segment 2 of Lecture 2. And here we look specifically at the book of Genesis, Creation Design, and with a focus on Genesis 1. In the last segment, we will look at Genesis 2. 
So what I'll do is I'll read the text to you and then draw out a number of points that we learn from the particular text. So as I said in the first segment that Jesus, and then we will see later in a later lecture, Paul also, when he's asked about human sexuality, divorce, marriage, sin, whatever, he always goes back to creation design and begins there. And then goes to the seventh commandment of Ponias, which breaks creation design, and then to the holiness code that basically details it. So in Genesis 1, we go to creation design. It's Genesis 1 is like the big broad lens of the story of creation. Genesis 2 is like the zooming down lens into exactly how the male was created and the female was created. But in Genesis 1, uh, from verse 1 and then verse 26 and 27, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless, and then the Holy Spirit hovered over the chaos, and then God said, Let there be light. And then God spoke five times, speaking different aspects of creation into being. And after every day of creation, he looked and said, it is good. Then on the sixth day, and this is the, the climax of God's creation. On the sixth day, God says, let us make, and the old English Bible, King James says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. The Hebrew doesn't say man. The Hebrew says, let us make ha-adam. Let us make the Adam in our image and in our likeness. And Adam in Hebrew comes from the word adama, which is ground or earth or dust. So in Genesis chapter 2, God formed the shape of a human being out of adama and breathed into that form his breath and he became a living Adam, an earthling, a human, an it. <laughs> Only in retrospect <laughs> that Adam was seen as male, but at the time it was just earthling because he's made from the earth. So let us make Adam, and I'm following the Hebrew in our image, not man, Adam, an earthling in our image and in our likeness, so that they and the Word in Hebrew changes to plural, so that they, let us make one earthling, so that they may rule over creation. So God created Ha'adam in his own image, male and female, God created them. Again, the plural, one and then two. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and rule over the earth. So just some observations. Ha'adam is earthling, <clears throat> a human being, as I've explained, which comes from Genesis chapter 2. Secondly, God's image is a complementary pair, which is the climax of all the pairs in Genesis 1. So if you read Genesis 1 carefully, it is full of pairs. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God separated light from darkness. Then there was night and then there was day. Then there was evening, then there was morning. There is land and sea. And if you read Genesis 1 in Hebrew, it's actually a poem. It's Hebrew poetry. And it's full of pairs culminating and climaxing in the sixth day of creation where God creates the human pair, male and female. And the human pair expresses his image. So God's image is a sexual pair that is a differentiated image of God as the climax of creation. What's interesting in the book of Genesis is that animals are created male and female. And it's referred to in Genesis 5 verse 2, 16 verse 9, chapter 7 verse 3, 9, 16, and it goes on. But the animals though created as male and female in pairs, are not the image of God, only human beings are, because human beings are inbreathed by God's breath and spirit, created with a will as moral human beings to make ethical choices 
that image God to creation. So there's a fundamental difference between animals and human beings, although we're both created as a sexual pair. The sexual pair are equal and compatible and complementary. I think that's really important to understand. Uh, equal, but compatible as in being complementary because both are given the rule and the authority over creation and both together procreate. You cannot procreate on your own, but only by male and female in a sexual union, which is called the covenant of marriage. And so um, human beings then are uniquely God's image, integrated image as a sexual pair, distinct from animals who have no sexual ethics. <laughs> and I just put this in here because we are not animals that are driven by instincts. You know, sometimes when you visit a person's home and their dog is so excited to see you, sometimes it wants to actually, you know, hump you, speaking crudely. <laughs> they have no uh, sexual ethics as in distinguishing what's good or bad, right or wrong, or what's socially appropriate or not socially appropriate. I say that because only human beings made in the image of God are moral beings that have sexual awareness in terms of what's appropriate or not, governed by moral values that actually express the image of God appropriately to all of creation. And when that goes wrong, the human beings as a sexual pair in terms of immoral sexual expression. We deface the image of God and we no longer represent God in creation, but we become driven by our own you know, lower appetites, our animal instincts. And the permissiveness of postmodern society is if you feel like it, do it. There's nothing wrong if you feel like it. As long as you don't harm other people, just do it. And you know, we're not animals. We are moral beings that image God to creation. And so it is really important that we understand that God's differentiated image through human sexuality as male and female uniquely images God to creation. And it's fundamentally about morality and ethics. So... Attention is given in this little text to the different kinds of creation because if you read Genesis 1 it says that God created the animals after their kind, the fish after their kind, the vegetables and trees after their kind. Each species is created after their kind and that human beings is uniquely created after God's kind. Because on the sixth day God said let us make human beings ha'adam in our image and in our likeness. We are created after God's kind. Therefore, um, we, um, in that sense again, are uniquely ethical or, or moral beings that image God or don't image God to creation. And when God looked at the creation of human beings in contrast to all the other forms of creation, we are very good, which basically means our differentiated um, human sexuality is actually a beautiful, very good gift of God that is enormously powerful because it creates other eternal human beings. I don't know if you ever thought of this reality, but it's amazing to think that a man and a woman can unite in the covenant of marriage under God and through sexual intimacy, sexual union, create eternal human beings. We, in some sense, through the power of free will and the gift of human sexuality, choosing one another in sexual union, play God by creating eternal human beings. So my wife, Jill, and me, in our marriage, we've had Zander, and our son and our daughter, Misha, and they will live forever. And we will live with them forever in the eternal ages to come. We created immortal, eternal human beings. That's actually the power of God. And that is the gift of human sexuality. And that's why God puts it in a covenant called marriage. It's like, it's like in South Africa, if you're watching it overseas, in South Africa we have a nuclear re a reactor, a nuclear power station outside Cape Town in Coburg. And there you, you, um, 
you fuse atoms and you cut atoms in the safety of a massive 10 meter wall of cement so that if things go wrong it doesn't explode and destroy Cape Town and the covenant of marriage is given by God as a kind of nuclear reactor in which we actually mix the sexual chemi chemicals of intercourse that creates eternal human beings. If sex is exercised outside of the covenant of marriage, its power can destroy society and obliterate it because of its promiscuity, because sexuality is, 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 is in that sense a very powerful gift from God to human beings. If expressed the right way, it's for the good of humanity. If expressed the wrong way, it effaces the image of God, destroys the image of God, is not good for humanity, and actually destroys creation. So coming to the end of, the, of a few implications here, is that male and female are what we can call angled expressions of God. So when God creates human beings in his own image, he creates the one Ha'adam, then he sexes, he sexes it into male and female, which is an expression of who God is. So we have to say that God contains in him, herself, both masculine and feminine. God doesn't have a body as human bodies have. So God is not a sexual being as in a biological sexual being. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 4, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So God is not a bodily being. Human beings are bodily beings. But we have the psycho-spiritual part of us of masculine and feminine. So we have to say male and female as a creation of God, expression of God's image, as masculine and feminine. God embodies masculine and feminine traits and much more. So therefore, in the Hebrew Old Testament, I don't know if you are aware of it, although God is called Father, He often is imaged as Mother and in lots of feminine terms. And I don't know if you are aware of it, just to take the point a bit further, is that in the Hebrew language, Spirit of God, the word Spirit, Ruach, is, a, is consistently a feminine noun in the Hebrew. So in Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning Elohim, which actually is plural. In the beginning God, as in gods, the plural, created the heavens and the earth. But the earth was without form and void, there was chaos. But the Spirit of God hovered over the chaos. The Ruach Ahelohim. The, ru the word ruach is a feminine noun. So the very first re reference to God after the word God is a feminine noun. So God is masculine and feminine. God is father and mother and much more. He is savior. He's healer. He's creator. He's, he's redeemer. <laughs> so just understand that when we say male and female are angled expressions of God, whereby we image God to the earth. Um, it is actually a very important and sacred calling to be human in that sense. So just to finish off this um, segment by saying that as individuals on our own, also we image God. We don't always only image God as a sexual pair of male and female, but I in my own right as a created human being also image God to creation and a woman on her own also images God and is the image of God. So I treat each person as the image of God with great dignity and respect. But when it comes to human sexuality, it was designed as a sexual pair within a covenant of marriage that then images God to creation. And all other forms of sexual um, imaging is not, uh, that is not part of creation design, does not express and further God's image, but another image on earth. And so the last point is then the stress on equality and compatibility um, opposes 
the male dominance that we've experienced through human history. So in Genesis 1, when God creates Ha'adam, sex is the one earthling into male and female, and then brings them together as a sexual pair to complete one another, gives them authority to rule over creation and to multiply, procreate and fill the earth. They ruled equally under God over creation. Only in Genesis 3, when they fell into sin and God pr pronounced a curse upon the woman and upon the man and upon the serpent and those on creation, only then it says that the man will rule over the woman. So when a man has to rule over his wife, it's actually not a blessing. <laughs> it's not part of God's original creation design. It's a this age arrangement in fallen creation as a restraint in terms of human corruption and human brokenness. So it's not a blessing. God's ideal is equality with complementarity as co-equals to rule over creation. It is not that the male dominates and the male rules. That is not God's creation design. So then we go into Genesis chapter 2, which is the zoom down picture into the specifics of how God made the male and the female. And that is for segment 2. Thank you. Okay, welcome back to segment three, our last segment of lecture two. And here we continue creation design. We looked at Genesis 1 and now we look at the zoom down picture of Genesis 2 and what that means for human sexual sexuality. Um, I just need to get my right PowerPoint up here. <clears throat> so Genesis 2 verse 7, I'll read the text for you. And if you are reading with me in your Bibles, you can follow. Then the Lord God formed Ha'adam. This is from the Hebrew. From the dust of the Adama, the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And Ha'adam became a living being. The earthling became a living being. And the Lord God took the Ha'adam and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So here just a few points in terms of understanding this, the implications of what this means. So the uniqueness of humanity as the created earthling after God's kind is that we are part dust and part glory. We are part body and part spirit. God's a spiritual being, a spirit being without a body. We are spirit body beings. So we inbreathed by God with glory, and yet we're made of dust. And it spoke of it speaks of the frailty of humanity, and yet the dignity and the glory of humanity as as bodily spiritual beings. And um, the the spirit part of us is that conscience um, of right and wrong that has to do with the gift of free will to choose right and wrong, the power of free will, to create, to create other human beings in sexual union, in, um, um, in marriage, or to choose to have sex outside of marriage and to begin to wreak havoc on planet Earth, basically. So will and conscience is the inner spirit. So the book of Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, has an interesting phrase. He sa it says, the spirit of of man and the word that is used there in Hebrew is Adam the spirit of the human being man is generic there for human beings Adam the spirit of Adam is the candle of the Lord that searches out the innermost parts of the human being so that's our conscience that tells us when we when we are disturbed and we think wrong thoughts or we feel bad feelings and it affects us and disturbs us and then we have to discern what's right, what's wrong, how do I respond, do I go with this or don't, do I resist it, how do I, how do I obey God. So in that sense human beings are not animals, we have a conscience, we are moral beings, we are made in God's image and we are given or rather created to work, rule and reign 
over the earth. So God entrusts the earth to us and we are stewards of God's creation, which means also we are stewards of our human sexuality. I'm not a victim of creation, of nature, of my biology, of my sexuality, that I'm driven by it. But I'm a steward it in accountability under God as our steward creation in accountability under God, because it's entrusted to us. And we will all account for how we have stewarded creation, our own bodies, our own minds, our own sexuality, our own emotions, because that's the way God created human beings. Then taking it further to the next text in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 and 21, it says, And then the Lord God said, It's not good for, the, for Ha'adam, the Adam, to be alone. That's in the garden. Because Adam was in the garden to till and look after the garden, and he walked around and he instinctively was looking for a partner, a companion, because he was lonely to complete him. And he was naming the animals in the garden. And God saw that Ha'adam was lonely and alone and looking for a companion. So the Lord God said, it is not good for Ha'adam to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The Hebrew Izer Kenegdo is a very important word, which I'm going to explain. So I'll make a helper suitable for Ha'adam. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground Adamma, all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. And he brought them to Ha'adam to see what he would name them. But for Adam, no helper suitable was found for him. So, Izer Kenegda, the word Izer is helper in the Hebrew. And Kenegda is basically a suitable counterpart. One is uniquely made to complete the other. And uh, it's actually made up in the Greek of as, um, the prefix ke, and or as his suitable partner, uniquely made, a spiritual um, a, a completion of this lonely Adam. And it implies in the Hebrew, the person is similar, but different. And that again comes out a bit later, because it's the idea of the one being cut into two that is both similar yet different, equal but complementary. This is what it means to be an Izer Kenegdo. Secondly, the important thing to understand is Izer, the word helper, is used in the Hebrew Old Testament 21 times. And of the 21 times, 16 are used of God himself. God is Israel's helper. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Where does my Izer come from? My Izer comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. <laughs> so God takes that word to himself. So to be created as a woman, a suitable companion, a helper to complete the man, is, a, is, is an idea of great dignity as opposed to inferiority. It used to be taught in traditional Christianity that woman as a helper was inferior. It's not. It's an equal, um, complementary companion that is like God completing Israel, which is, I find it's amazing. It's not a subordinate, but it is actually a superordinate <laughs> of of God completing us. So we all instinctively in creation have a yearning and desire for completion. That's the way God has made human beings. And that yearning that's built into creation for completion is fulfilled in God's soulmate or partner that he has for us as male or female within the covenant of marriage. And the way that happens specifically, according to Genesis 2, is in the next text. So Genesis 2 verse 21 now I'm reading. It says, So the Lord God caused the Adam to fall into a deep sleep. It's wonderful that when God made the Izer Kenegda, the woman, 
He wanted Adam to have nothing to do with it. <laughs> he put him to sleep under general anesthetic. And while he was sleeping, he took one of his ribs, that's the NIV. But the Hebrew word tzela is actually his side. He took his side from his side and then closed up the place with the flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the tzela, from his side, that he had taken out of the Adam. And then he brought her to the Adam. And this is interesting in Hebrew. The first time is the differentiating between male and female. Because it says, then the Lord God made a, a woman. The word there is Isha. From the side of the earthling, the Adam. And he made the, the woman and he brought her back to the Adam. And it was then for the first time when Adam saw the woman, he saw himself in the mirror of the opposite other then he saw himself more accurately for who he was. In other words, when God created the woman and brought her to Adam and he looked at her, then he realized, ah, I'm different to you. <laughs> we are similar, but different. Now I see who I am more accurately in the mirror of who you are and God has made you to be. And that is a profound truth in all of life is we only really see ourselves for who God has made us to be in the mirror of the complementary but opposite other person who is similar but different to us. But I'm running ahead of myself. The word tzela is a beautiful word like izeg. Tzela, the side, is a Hebrew word used 33 times in the Old Testament. And almost all of the references have to do with the sacred architecture in the temple and the tabernacle. In other words, um, women are God's sacred design in a beautiful, differentiated way to the male. And interesting, in the Hebrew, the word that is used for God uh, forming the woman is the word benah, which is he built her as a piece of sacred architecture that was beautiful and unique and different. And the word that was used earlier in Genesis 2 verse 6, where, the God, where God formed Adam out of the earth, is a different word, Yeser, which is he created, but he built and architecturally formed the sacred piece of beauty to complete the man. So in Hebrew, it's different words used to show the beautiful mystery of human sexuality as similar but different that has the fire of attraction and yearning to come together in a completion that makes us whole as human beings so um, richard davidson says in his book the flame of yahweh that eve was not taken from the feet of adam to be his slave and neither did god take eve from the head of, Ab of Adam for her to rule over him. But God took Eve from the side of Adam to be his co-equal beloved, side by side, heart to heart. From the side, Tzela is the closest thing to the heart. So that speaks of this. And when Adam saw Eve, he said, You are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And it reinforces the idea that male and female are taken from the one into the two to be completed in, in, in a union, a sexual union. And there's emphasis in the Hebrew, this idea of from. In verse 21 it says, God took from his side, then God built from the Adam, then verse 23, this is bone from my bone. Then verse 23 again, uh, because from the man she was taken. Four times it mentions from, and the reason is given in verse 24. When Adam saw Eve, he said, you are bone of my bone, from me you've been taken. And for this reason, the ish, the man, the word changes, will leave his father and mother and will be united to the isha, the woman. And the two shall become one. And so what was missing in Adam is now represented in his counterpart, 
that God has built as a beautiful architectural design to complete him. And the idea is that one flesh was divided to be united as an indivisible whole, which is healthy human sexuality. And so we, the image of the one becoming two, so that the two shall become one, is the basis of creation design in human sexuality. And it's within the covenant of marriage. And so we complete each other as complementary opposites. And sexual union, therefore, is the seal and the fulfillment of that marriage covenant. And that's why you have this whole idea that develops in the Old Testament. That the covenant of marriage is the place that is celebrated through sexual union. And it is the seal of that covenant when two virgins marry and then break their virginity by sexual union, which is a, a wonderful chemical explosion in their bodies that imprints itself in the body memory of a deep, profound bonding. The word to cleave, he will cleave and leave his father, mother, cleave to his wife, speaks of that cement, the glue, the cement, the binding of the covenant of marriage that is sealed and consummated in sexual intimacy that becomes lifelong monogamous partners of ever deepening love and relationship. And uh, the chemicals that are released in sexual intimacy are binding chemicals. So to conclude, therefore the purpose of genital sexuality within the covenant of marriage is first of all, to celebrate the covenant of marriage, which is sexual faithfulness in the covenant of loyal love. It is companionship, which has to do with the affection and the, and the bonding that's making love. It's celebration. Sex in marriage is a celebration that's enjoying love, the pleasure. God created sexuality for human pleasure and enjoyment. And lastly, it's for co-creation. The purpose of sex and it's the sealing of the covenant for the companionship within covenant, the celebration of covenant, and then the, the co-creation, which is children and family and making new human beings that are eternal, immortal human beings that are the image of God. And just to close and say, only a biologically born male and a biologically born female within a covenant of marriage through sexual union can create other human beings. And today we have, through medical science, multiple various ways of creating human beings in test tubes and very many different ways outside of the covenant of marriage. The way God, the, the way God made the male body, the way God made the female body, complements and fits together so that it creates human beings. A male and a male body in sexual union does not create another human being. A female and a female in sexual union does not create another human being. And that's why God's creation design is male and female in the covenant of marriage. So that's the end of our lecture. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.